Empire. We're talking hot QBs, and then it's on to the week four outlook. This is the Football Jones Podcast. What's up, everybody? It's Mike Jones. Thanks for coming back for another episode, episode 15. You can read me at usatoday.com. You can follow me on Twitter at by Mike Jones. Follow me on Instagram at by Mike Jones. A lot to talk about today. The first quarter of the season is almost in the books, and guys, players, teams have really started to define themselves. And so today, we're going to talk about two of the biggest stories of the season so far, and that is quarterbacks Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson. Yes, I know there have been bigger stories, but I'm talking about on-field action. On-field action is what we're sticking to this week. We're not going to worry about all the off-field drama. Thankfully, it's been a little quieter on that front, and we can focus on football. So today, I'm huddling up with my guy, uh, Jared Bell, fellow columnist from USA Today. And we're going to talk about Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson, who he covered on Sunday. He was at that game in Kansas City. Talk about his observations and his analysis of those guys and um, where he thinks that their teams are headed. Talk, we're going to talk about some of the other things going on in the league and their division and um, a few other uh, teams here and there as well. So really looking forward to that. And then we're going to wrap it up with my uh, week four preview all the games, game by game, predictions, players to watch, um, and uh, then that'll be a wrap. So here we go. When we come back, we're talking to JB. All right, and we are happy once again to have the OG Jarrett Bell here on the Football Jones podcast. JB, I know you've been bouncing around. Um, a lot of different places. And last week, there were two games that I was like, if I could go, if the bosses send me to one of these two games, I will be happy. One of those was the Rams and the Browns, and one of those was KC and Baltimore. You got KC and Baltimore, and I was a little bit jealous. Um, <laughs> but uh, so just tell me, the two, they're two hottest quarterbacks, young quarterbacks. What did you see from those guys, and, and what did you take away from that game? Yeah, you know what's interesting is that, you know, Kansas City – uh, got out to that huge lead by the half. I mean, it's 23 to six, and you think the game is over. And much like the Ravens in that playoff game last year against the Chargers, where it was a big lead, and Lamar Jackson um, does not give up, and right. neither does his team. And so they fought back and, and made it a game and made the Chiefs sweat. I mean, the game was not really over until Kansas City made a first down with about a minute and a half to go. But at that point, uh, Baltimore still had a fighting chance. Now, it's also interesting that in the midst of all the great quarterback play, we saw John Harbaugh go for two, like, three times and not make it at all. Right. And it, it really got me to thinking about the whole idea of when you go for two and when not. And when it's early in the game, I don't think it's worth the risk. And yeah. the reason why is because if you don't make it, then you're almost forced to go for two the next time, even right. if you don't want to. You don't have to, uh -huh. but, you know, the Ravens spent that that game really chasing those two points, and then they didn't make it again, then they didn't make it again. Right. So you could look at it and say, well, if they had just kicked the extra point each time, that's three points, and guess what? Now they're within a field goal of, of, <laughs> of what they needed to do yeah. against Kansas City. And so – it could come back to haunt you. It really, do, it really does. And, you know, Harbaugh was talking about it after the game, about how the analytics show this and that. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's crap, especially early in the game. It's late mm -hmm. in the game. It's in the fourth quarter. Like Washington the other night, they were trying to come back and might yeah. come back. No problem with them going for two in that situation. It's the second half. It's the fourth quarter. But first quarter, going for two, uh-uh. Uh -uh. But And also anyway. I noticed that – that stadium, at least on TV, seemed like it was silent when they scored that touchdown. They stopped them on that two-point conversion, and the Chiefs came to life, the fans came to life, and it was just like the momentum just, boom, you know. Um, it, it did. It did. Now, I think that's a great point because as I was sitting there watching it, I'm like, okay, this is the perfect way for Baltimore to start. And 
they go down and 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 actually Kansas City had the opening drive yeah. and they were forced to punt. So they had their swing at it, and then Baltimore comes and has this long drive and scores a touchdown when they did go for it on fourth down. And I don't have as much of a problem with that, especially since they made it. Um, but, you know, they did what they wanted to do early in the game, silence the crowd, take some control, and then it just flipped on them just like that. Um, but, yeah, the two-point um, conversion attempt did backfire. And then Patrick Mahomes. So we talk about him, and you look at – the numbers that he has right now. Yeah. And he's on a pace right now for like 6,300 yards. I had to go to the record book, uh, yeah. Jonesy, to see, okay, what's the record now? Yeah. And he would obliterate the record. It was Peyton Manning who threw for like 5,400, 5,500 yards in a season. And, and uh, yeah, I remember Peyton had like the 55 touchdowns and stuff too. And so – Mahomes is on pace to do all that. Now, it's so early in the season that you can, you know, really kind of pump the brakes on a guy being on pace. Right. Let's see where they are after, like, eight games or ten games when you start talking about the records. But the point is, he's off to a hot start. And even if you don't look at the numbers and you just say, what do you expect from this kid from last year to this year, there's going to be improvement just because – <laughs> he's got a little bit more experience, right? And so, you know, when I saw him the other day, man, he looked like he was just in total control, saw everything. And even with all of those big numbers, the other thing that is, you know, impressive in its own right is the fact that he hasn't thrown any interceptions. Yeah. So for a guy who throws it that much, you know, you know, last year he threw 10 picks, which is not a lot at all. No, right, right. Yeah. If you talk about going through a season and you're under 10, you're in single digits with the interceptions, then what does that do for your team? Right. So you got that. Do you know what he can do? He can throw it deep. He can throw it short. He's got touch. He can scramble, avoid. So he does all these things. He can throw it when he's under pressure. He had a touchdown the other day where um, the blitz was coming from the corner and he had a split second to get it away and he got it away and it was a perfect touch pass. Demarcus Robinson made a great catch one-handed in the end zone. So he can do all the things right. that you want from a quarterback. And, and when you compare him to Lamar, you know, Lamar, I think he has the capability of doing anything, making any throw as well. And his throws, like, outside the numbers are great. And he had a couple of, you know, breathtaking moments, yeah. a couple of Hail Marys that, that landed. And so mm -hmm. you can't count him out either. But I think the thing, uh, just to go to the Chiefs, back to the Chiefs for a minute, that makes them so scary on offense is the fact, A, they don't have Tyreek Hill. Right. And they didn't miss a beat without him. Okay, this this rookie, McCall Hartman, is like, you know, blazing fast. He's like Olympic <laughs> speed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, gold, Olympic gold medal fast, right? Um, so you got him now plugged in there. And when Tyreek comes back and you have, you know, all of those guys, because Demarcus Robinson is a guy that I know I've watched him because I had him on my fantasy team like two <laughs> years ago. So I've seen, you know, seen him kind of progress. Right. And he's better than he was two years ago and and better than last year. And then, oh, by the way, you still have Travis Kelsey there. And now you add Shady McCoy to this deal. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and McCoy, I think, is going to be that back for them who can do – wonders in the passing game and the running game. They've got a rotation of backs. So they've just got a lot of different ways that they can attack and, and be balanced. The big problem with them, or the big question anyway, is the defense. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about Baltimore being able to come back in the second half, well, a lot of that is on the Kansas City defense because mm -hmm. Ravens had little resistance um, in, in moving up and down the field like two, three straight possessions. And and actually, um, Kansas City's offense stalled too. So you've got two parts to to kind of make a comeback. And um, Kansas City got it done in the end. Uh -huh. And Frank Clark made a big sack. It was his first uh, sack as a Chief to shut down one of those drives, forced him to take three instead of it was in the red zone too. So that was a big big sack. But uh, Kansas City's defense, I think it's better than last year. Tyron Matthew is. Uh -huh you know, really solid for their secondary. But, again, 
is that going to be a championship level defense or just a better defense? Right. And, you know, we'll see as the season progresses. So um, don't want to just totally count them out. And they may not be a classic, you know, they're not going to be a classic Chicago Bears right, right, championship right, right. defense. Yeah. But maybe they'll be good enough to, you know, to hold Tom Brady <laughs> in the fourth it's quarter. Good that's right. the ultimate test, right? It's yeah. like, do you have a championship yeah. defense or not? Well, can you can you handle Tom Brady when you have to? Which is why they were one of the teams that, you know, reportedly is interested in, you know, Jalen Ramsey, you know, because yeah. they're just yeah. trying to yeah. beef up, beef yeah. up for Brady, you know? Um, the thing that's really amazing to me about Mahomes is that, okay, Sometimes you have some success, and then the second year, defenses have the playbook. They, they see what you do right or wrong, how the fortune and weaknesses. It doesn't look like they figured him out. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. I think part of the reason for that is because he can do so many things that other quarterbacks can't do. So I had my notepad, you know, logging the game in the press box, right, which we all do. Yeah. And so I went into the game saying, okay, I'm going to circle – things that other quarterbacks can't do or don't do, right? Okay, right. So whenever I saw either or, you know, Mahomes or Jackson do something, and I said, okay, nobody's really going to make that throw, or not many people are going to make that throw. I think that's one of the reasons why. And when you think about Mahomes and Jackson, by the way, as well, they're both so difficult to game plan for because they break off script mm -hmm. and they can make big plays by buying time or with some uncanny throw or something like that. And then the Chiefs put this play in the other day where Mahomes, like, hides the ball behind his hip <laughs> for, like, a split second, and then he fires it over the field, over the, the middle for a completion. So um, I think that's the thing is that they're always – you know, there's going to be that cat-and-mouse game with defensive coordinators. And so, yes, Kansas City, and I'm talking, obviously, Andy Reid and Eric Bieniemy, the offensive coordinator – they are going to be challenged to, to keep trying to do different things. But Reed was talking about uh, – and then Mahomes has his input too. So Reed yeah. was talking about this after the game. The one play that kind of sealed it at the end, it was a third and eight maybe or something like that, it ended up being a little screen pass after Mahomes like pumped left and then, you know, looked right and found Williams in, in the flat. And they ended up getting, you know, 15, 20 yards. And it was, like I said, iced the game. But Reed said after the game, he says, that was Patrick's play. And they said, well, what do you mean by that? He said, well, you know, we have a package of plays, and we go through the script, and when we're in this situation, what do we want to do? And I like to have the players have their input. And he said, Mahomes was adamant that if we had this situation at this point in the game in the four-minute offense, this is the play he wanted to run. And so when you hear that, yeah. You say, oh, yeah, he's, he's growing even more. And like Reed was saying, you know, he's always had that with him, had it last year with him. But, you know, you just take the experience of a guy who's out there on the field doing it, it, it that has to give him confidence, give the team confidence, all that. Yeah, so cool. when you talk about putting a book together for him, it better be a fat book. Yeah, okay? yeah exactly. So there's a lot of different ways he can hurt you and they can hurt you. And that's that's going to be the beauty um, of what Kansas City is, is able to do or as they try to grow this thing is – for as great as he is, if you could take pressure off of him by um, having all these different places to go and all these different weapons, then, you know, yeah. the sky's the limit. Exactly. Now I'm looking at their schedule here. So they got the Lions, then they got the Colts, the Texans, Broncos, Packers, Vikings, Titan. Where, where's, their, where's their big challenge going to come from? I mean, it might be Sunday in Detroit. Okay. <laughs> I, I, was look, I was thinking about it. I said, like, you know what? This is a trap game for them. Okay. And I haven't watched the Lions much, but, you know, that's my hometown team. So I'm, I'm always kind of trying to keep a bead on them. Right. And I'm not, like, you know, campaigning for Matt Patricia or anything like, like that. Okay. So still, the jury's still out on him. But they went in and beat Philadelphia on Sunday, and I don't think anybody saw that coming. Right, right. I think mean, when you saw the Lions blow a lead at Arizona to end up tied and could have lost it at Arizona, you say, okay, these are the same old Lions. So I'm going to be interested just to kind of see how that game kind of plays out, right? Okay, okay right. Um, but, you know, they beat the Chargers. So mm -hmm. that's a quality win for Detroit. You know, and it, it was at home, but they beat the Chargers. And a lot of people – 
think the Chargers are a Super Bowl contender, right? Mm -hmm. And the Chargers yeah. and the Chiefs are going to have to, you know, settle it to see. That. And when you ask about the Chiefs, that's the other, you know, divisional game that's going to you know, – two divisional games that, you know, are going to tell us a lot about them. Because remember, the Chargers beat them in Kansas City. Yeah, yep, you're right, you're and right. So those two teams, you know, it could, it, it could still go either way until – further until proven otherwise to further notice so they'll have that um but i think this game at detroit this week uh it just you know i'm just not gonna say it's an automatic thing because the lions are you know are crazy like that yeah you know, yeah you, you know they're, they're not going to the super bowl i can declare that right now <laughs> right. but they, they will trip somebody up along the way so they already got philly Maybe they've got another one in them. Right. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Now, um, as we look over to Baltimore, that side of the ball, um, I, I know we both covered Lamar Jackson, saw him live last year. I'm going to see him this Sunday. You saw him this past Sunday. I saw him in training camp. And the thing that was impressive was just how quickly he was getting the ball out. Um, but in training camp, he was very inaccurate. Now that they're in the regular season, he's really throwing with accuracy. Um, what are you seeing that they did with him that shows his growth and just the confidence they have in him compared to what you saw last year? Yeah, and, and I saw him in the offseason too, just like you. And I wondered, whoa, what is, what the heck is is going on when you know, when you watch him in those mini camps? And I guess that's what practice is for. Players will tell you that if you're gonna make your mistakes. Because when I was there in May or whatever it was, May or June for one of the mini camps. Uh -huh. And I watched him, you know, throughout the whole practice. He made some really good plays and then he did some stuff that were, you know, would qualify as really bad plays and right. bad throws and way up. So we saw a lot of that last year. So between then and now, I think what, what happens, uh, the same type of growth I mentioned from a homes where just that experience is going to help a player generally um, improve and, and see things better. So Lamar is going to have that. And regardless of how it looks to us on the outside, from the inside, that's got to be a big thing, especially where he had the whole off season. Mm -hmm. He starts the season as the starter, as opposed to coming in off the bench like he did last year. So that's big. Now, in terms of the accuracy and why he's more accurate, I, I don't know that because I've talked to some quarterbacks over the years about accuracy issues. And a lot of them will tell you, that you can't coach accuracy. Right, now, right. I don't know if I believe that because, you know, in fact, uh, Tony Romo <laughs> owes me an explanation, right? <laughs> because uh -huh. towards the end of his career, he told me that he did some things to improve his accuracy. And I said the same thing I just said a minute ago. Well, I, I heard you can't really coach accuracy. He said, oh, yes, you can. I said, well, how'd you do it? I can't tell you. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is at the end of his career. He says, I can't tell you. But, you know, after I retire, I'll tell you one of these days, right? right, right. So I got I to gotta catch up with Romo at some point. But <laughs> as it relates to Lamar, um, yeah, it, it looks like he's able to, you know, get the ball where he wants to get it. And I think maybe part of that has to do with comfort in the, the offense, your guys knowing where they need to, to be. And it's, so it's on the teammates as well. But then the other thing is just, you know, kind of seeing things better. And that goes back to the game slowing down a little bit as you get a little bit more experience. So that's about the best way I can explain it. And then yeah. you'll see a bunch of stuff that you can't explain. Right, right, yeah. So I challenge you when you see them this week okay. to, to look at some plays and, and, you know, check it in your notebook. Like, okay, that was one. I, you, you can't draw up, right? Right. right so, yeah. yeah, that's the beauty of guys like that. Yeah. Um, so, so when you said, you know, he doesn't give up, was there a particular moment where you thought he was about to fade and then, you know, he broke through or, you know, what was some of that resiliency you saw? Yeah, I, I think it was just looking at the scoreboard, you know, because you come out of the half and it's 23 to, to, to six or 20, yeah, yeah, 23 to six. And then you say, well, there's no way they're going to, going to be able to come back in this game because Kansas City is just so much on fire. And they came out in the second half, and they just had a really strong, balanced drive. And that's the other thing. It's not all on Lamar because, you know, Mark Ingram is huge for them, mm -hmm. okay? You think right. back to last year, they had Gus the Bus, who's still there, and they had like a two- or three-headed uh, running back monster, and it worked for them to a degree. But, but this year, Ingram has given them that – 
you know, that one feature back, even though Gus came in a game the other day and played some and they could relieve him. But I think from what I saw last week, they're putting it, you know, primarily on Ingram. And he right. just really gives them some, you know, some some solidity, if you some he solidifies that offense, if you will. He looks um, a little more refreshed and a little more explosive than last year, does he? A little quicker too? Yeah, so far he sure does, yeah. And maybe, you know, some of that has to do with, you know, being in a new place and, yeah, uh -huh. and saying, okay, I need to show that I can still get this done. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, he's he's been big. Yeah. So what do you think um, for, for Lamar, um, what is the big challenge for him um, going forward as defensive starting to see him? Um, and where do you, how do you think he's going to respond to that challenge? Yeah. You know, the one thing I like about him and liked about it last year, liked about him last year, is that he does protect the football mm -hmm. pretty well when he throws it. I think you almost worry more about him um, losing the football if he's, you know, running or trapped in the pocket. But he, he does a good job of not throwing picks, okay? Right. Um, so I think the growth with him probably just comes with to continue to, you know, to make those dynamic plays downfield, finding people, uh, making it. And he does a good job, too, of protecting himself when he does run. So, you know, it's it's just a matter of, you know, managing the game. Right. And, you know, so often it, it falls on the quarterback, but many times it's not really the quarterback's fault, per se, what happens with the flow of the game. If your defense is not playing and they give up two touchdowns, you know, what? Also, if they have a, a special return, they have some, a special teams return. So a lot of things are going to happen that are not in his control. So I think the thing I want to see from him is just that consistency of, of staying up because the one thing I think we see with Lamar, he does seem like a, a real human being playing football, right? Yeah. yeah uh -huh. and, and he can get down on himself if there's a bad play or the game situation, you know, dictates that much. And we haven't seen much of that this year, and there was not a lot of time for that the other day. But I think back to that playoff game against the Chargers when – it had really gotten out of hand, and he was the, the crowd was booing and all that stuff, and and he was down on himself. I remember talk, I remember him talking about it after the game. Well, he collected himself, so maybe you know he'll he'll gain something through experience and just being you know a little you know more consistent as things go on in terms of what's you know happening with his psyche and stuff. But that's not even a a knock per se because he's a young cat and. He's, you know, it's not like he has not demonstrated a whole lot of confidence, you know, throughout his year and change in the NFL. Yeah. If he continues to play like this, they win their division. You think he's an MVP candidate? Yeah, he'd be a candidate. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I think he'd be a candidate. Um, and the, the tricky thing is going to be Mahomes and what right. kind of numbers he puts up, right? Yeah. Because you, you really can't knock that. Um, but yeah, I would think. Yeah, Lamar would be a guy you think because you know you can always give Tom Brady the MVP award, and I think that actually hurts Tom Brady. Now. Right. He's like, oh yeah, we'll save him for the Super Bowl MVP award, right? Uh -huh. yeah. um, you know, so so Brady's always a guy like that. Um, if what if Delvin Cook rushes for two thousand yards and the the Vikings win the division, um, something like that, you know? So you'll have you know players like that that might have you know, uh, you know, phenomenal seasons in their own right. So, um, yeah, if you start looking at it right now after two or three weeks into the season, yeah, I, I think you you give him that. And the, and the other thing that I think will help the sentiment for Lamar is the fact that Bill Polian uh -huh. <laughs> and so many other people said, okay, this guy can't be a quarterback. He's got to be a running back and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So I think that actually helps him you know, from a, you know, a perception standpoint. And I think people can relate to that, right? Yeah, right? That when people tell you you can't do something and then you go and you do it and, you know, you look at them and, you, yeah, you might not see him as, you know, the classic, obviously you don't see him as a classic drop back passer, but you might nitpick and say, oh, it, did, it looked ugly. Or didn't. But then when you look up and he completed like 74% of his passes, right, right. And like five touchdowns, I mean, what can you say? Yeah. Um and so uh, I think that's the thing with Lamar that 
you know, really kind of has everybody's attention and saying, yeah, this is the guy they said couldn't do it. And, you know, before it's all over with Ozzie Newsome, he, he may he may live up to that old wizard <laughs> yeah. thing. Because what, what's on the other side of Lamar Jackson in terms of quarterback um, value and comparison? It's Baker Mayfield, right? right? Right. And Baker Mayfield, for all the things you might like about him, dude is real careless with the football. Yes, he is. Okay. Yeah. So he's got, what, five picks already this year? Yep. And, yep. you know, I and mentioned that he gets flustered. I mean, right. you know, he'll break the pocket and start scrambling around thinking there's pressure there that's not really even there. Yeah. Um, you know, so, yeah. I, I, yeah. And, and throw some wild throws and stuff. And you, and you see that. And what if he takes a real big hit this week against Baltimore, next week, whenever he plays? You know, when, it just in the course of playing football, he's going to take some more hits. You know, it's not automatic that that doesn't affect you moving forward okay in terms of your decision making so if you think he's flustered now right wait until he takes a few real shots um yeah. that that could really affect him but the thing about baker mayfield that just rubs me the wrong way is that he just seems to be so cocky and so arrogant he's got all these commercials and stuff too this year right. so what does that say about um you know where he's at Right. Well, I think he's trying to cash in, you know. I think his people are like, hey, look, it's hot. Let's jump on it right here. Um, but I, I, do always what you're to. Saying. I, I do what you're saying, but I did appreciate after the game on Sunday night that people asked, look, because Freddie Kitchens called a bad game. He made it really bad. And Baker said, look, I know what you guys are trying to do. It's not on the play calling. It's on me, you know. I didn't execute. I'm going to be having reoccurring nightmares of missing Jarvis, you know, and throwing to somebody else. So he did accept that there. But you're right. He is cocky, especially out there on that field. And so the linebackers are coming for him, ready to, you know, to put him in his place. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes you can be, you know, too cocky for your own good or, or you, you know, you can be overconfident and try to do things that you shouldn't do because you want to play hero ball right. and things like that. So that's what I would be concerned about with Baker Mayfield as opposed to, you know, a guy like Lamar who plays with a lot more maturity mm -hmm. than Baker Mayfield. And obviously Mahomes also plays with a lot of maturity. And these guys have every right to be as cocky as Baker Mayfield. And so um, that's the thing with him that, you know, we'll see how it plays out. And maybe, you know, he grows because he'll get more experience and, and you know, just kind of check himself, if you will. But as I look at it right now, and I say, well, that was the number one quarterback in the draft, and Lamar Jackson was taken at number 32. Mm -hmm. it, 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 you know, who's better? And right. right now, Lamar Lamar's better. Yeah, exactly. Well, look, I'm not going to hold you too much longer, but since we're talking about their division, let me just get your take on um, the Steelers, because beginning of the year, I thought that, you know, even though they lost Antonio Brown and Le'Veon Bell, I thought Big Ben was going to keep them in the thick of things. They were going to have a chance to win their division. Now, it looks like, I mean, I think their season could be lost. But what do you think? Because I know you've spent some time in Pittsburgh. You know, you're well-connected there. What do you think? Yeah, it, it, well, I think that it's still too early to count them out. I mean, but, you know, 0-3 is 0-3. And that game the other day in San Francisco where they had all those turnovers and still lost, um, you know, <laughs> red flag right um but the fact that they had all those turnovers right. <laughs> um we haven't seen a whole lot of that from the Steelers defense in the last couple three years right right and so they spent a lot of time and a lot of energy during the offseason really trying to upgrade that defense and how about Minka Fitzpatrick who they acquire in the fire sale from Miami and he comes and he gets like two turnovers in his first game as a Steeler. Yeah. Um, the, the rookie, you know, uh, Devin uh, Bush. Right. Good deal for them, right? And, you know, TJ Watt still getting better. And and, and so I, I, I think the Steelers finally have a defense that, well, again, man, it, it, maybe not. Because <laughs> I'm thinking they always have these problems with the Patriots, right? Right. right and yeah. at the first game of the season, they got blown out by the Patriots. Ooh. It's like, Okay, so the Patriots are a measuring stick for a lot of people. Right, right. They are more of a measuring stick for the Steelers yeah, exactly. than anybody because the Steelers have been in that position where they've had to play them so often and, and in the playoffs and they just can't 
you know, do anything with it. They, well, they beat them last year in Pittsburgh, so I'll yeah. give them that. Um, and Tom Brady looked awful. So then they go and they open the season and you saw what happened. So yeah. um, the, the, the problem now is that they need the defense to do even more than yeah. you probably could have hoped going into the season. And I don't know if that's possible. And now you've got the young quarterback who should get better, with, but it takes time, yeah, time exactly. experience and, and all of that. And, and then, you know, James Conner banged up. So you really don't have that running game that's consistent enough to say we can do this to take the pressure off. They've just got they've got a lot of holes, man. Yeah, yeah. And it's it, it's it's tough because if Ben was there, they'd still have a lot of those holes, even though it looked like they had addressed them. You know, you bring in Moncrief, you got James Washington going into the second year, um, Deontay Johnson, this rookie that they they promoted to the starting lineup mm-hmm. was really when I was there in training camp. He was really good. It was early in camp, like second week or – no, it was like the first week of camp. But you could tell, boom, that guy can play. Right. And so to see him go into the starting lineup already, um, yeah, that, that, that might be good for them. But how long is it going to take for all of this to come together? So I, I still say you can't write them off because if they have a, a big game and put it all together against Baltimore, if they can take care of Cleveland, right. then they're right back in there. But – um, the clock is ticking, and you know the pressure is only going to intensify on Mike Tomlin. Although you know, I I think it'd be a stretch to say his job is in trouble, especially after losing. Yeah, not now. Yeah, exactly. But, but the noise will not cease. Yeah, exactly. It will continue, and, and even if they do get out of their division, they're going to run into the Patriots again, and Tom Brady versus Mason Rudolph just ain't a fair fight. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Or Mason Rudolph and Patrick Mahomes. Or yeah. Mason Rudolph and Jacoby <laughs> Brissett. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> or Deshaun Watson and Mason. Yeah, exactly. Just nobody. Yeah, yeah. But Houston, but, but Houston's a team, man. You know, after I, you know, I really I blew it by saying I think the Titans are going to be ready to step up and take yeah. what was you know, Indianapolis's division yeah. and or the Indianapolis and Houston. But I thought I thought Tennessee was ready, man. And then they go out in week one and they put it on the Browns and then right. since then But it's uh, the quarterback. I mean Marcus Mariota, the, the the thing that was really eye opening and people told me that, you know, you know, he you gotta scheme stuff up for him. But when I really realized the problem with him was when I was at their joint practices during training camp and Tom Brady's on this field and right next to him, Marcus Mariota's. And at one point they ran almost the same play. It was, they faked the hand off the play or they rolled a little bit to the right and Brady throws the pass before his guy's even looking. Turn around, boom, ball's right there. Mariota does the same thing, holds it, holds it, holds it up. Oh, somebody's coming, you know, and then he's in trouble. His anticipation just is not there. He has to see stuff wide, wide open. Um, and I think that's what hurts their offense because they have some, they have some pieces to work with there. Yeah. Um, yeah. But he just, you know, and then in that game I was at when they were playing the, uh, the Colts a couple weeks ago, they're driving down to get into field goal range and he clocks the ball twice. And one of them was on third down. And that set up a fourth down at the 50-yard line. You got to, you know, get the first down. And he said afterwards, I guess I should have had a play in my head to run on the next. Yeah, you know, like you're directing this no-huddle offense, running down, you should know what you got to do, the situation. So I just don't know about his awareness. Um, I thought that they could be something too, but, I mean, Ryan Tannehill is going to be in that spot before, you know, the season comes to an end, I think. That's that's crazy because you think about uh, Mariota and Jameis Winston right. and what we were saying about them when they came out of college. Like, well, you could take either one and you'd be okay. And here we are, and you don't want either one of them. <laughs> right, right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But, Man, okay. yeah, crazy. Who would have thought? Right, yep. it just shows quarterbacks not an exact science at all. But, I know. Tell that to the Miami Dolphins, right? Because yeah, yeah, they're yeah. thinking and they're going to grab a quarterback at some point. They better make sure they pick the right one. Exactly. Well, JB, I really appreciate your time, man. Where are you going to be this weekend? I'm going to New Orleans. Okay, that's right. You said Cowboys, Saints. Okay, that's going to be a good game there. Sunday Um, Sunday night, yeah. Very intriguing, you know. We'll see.
Yeah, exactly. Hey, we're going to catch up with you in a couple more weeks. Always enjoy rapping with you. And um, tell everybody where they can find you. Obviously, usatoday.com. Where else do they find you? Yeah, that Twitter, uh, at your Bell, and Facebook, and usatoday.com. Yeah. All right, man. Thanks yeah. a lot. Okay, man. Take care. hope you guys enjoyed that it was really um insightful to me i tell you jb has been doing this for a long time um i always learn something from him when we're just even for rapping on the phone about um the league or the process doing this job uh gaining insight and so i really enjoyed talking to him right there it's going to be interesting to see um how this season continues to play out for those uh young quarterbacks we talked about and high how high their teams can soar when we come back, like I said, we're going to get to it game by game, the preview for week four, what you can look for, players to watch, and what you can expect for the outcomes of these games, taking another stab at it. We'll be right back. Okay, so here we go. We're going to start it off Thursday night football. The Eagles visiting the Packers. Eagles are coming off of a loss. The Packers are 3-0. Off to a hot start. Um, they haven't been perfect, but you can see that they're starting to figure things out with new coach Matt LaFleur. He and Aaron Rodgers are getting synced up. But what's most impressive about these Packers, I think so far, is the, the dominance of their defense. And so um, it's going to be you know on them. Obviously, they're going to put up points on offense, uh, but their defense dismantling, disrupting the Eagles offense is what's going to be the key to this game. So my player to watch for this week is Preston Smith. Outside linebacker continues to have an impact with this team um, after signing in the offseason after being with Washington for all of his career. Um, had a forced fumble. He's got a interception. He's had a number of sacks. Uh, just really making an impact. So we'll see what he can do as he goes out there trying to disrupt the flow of Carson Wentz and the Eagles offense. So he's my player to watch on that side of the ball. My player to watch on Philly's side is running back Miles Sanders. Look, the Eagles are still a little bit shorthanded at wide receiver position, and there's going to be more pressure on Wentz. So they've got to be able to establish the running game. They have not done a great job of that so far. Sanders leads them in rushing, but he has not been consistent as well. So they need him this week to find his groove, get going against uh, this Packers uh, defense. But again, I've got the Packers winning 28-22. Next up, we got two teams coming off of a loss. The Titans visiting the Falcons. Um, neither one of these teams are off to the start that they would like. Uh, the Falcons are back at home, though. They're going to see if they can bounce back. I'm picking them 25-18. The guy to watch on that side of the ball is Matt Ryan. I am really kind of surprised at the start that he has had to the season. He's thrown six interceptions. He's had interceptions in each of the three games. Never in his career has he thrown interceptions in three straight games. But he has done it this year. And their offense is not playing up to its level of potential. Truthfully, Matt Ryan and that offense have not been the same since Kyle Shanahan left for San Francisco. Um, they have just not had their groove. And we're going to see if they can get right as they're back home. Uh, again, they're going against a team that's coming off of a loss. Pretty good defense, but um, a loss nonetheless. My player to watch for the Titans is Marcus Mariota because watch him now. This very well could be the last time he starts for that team because he has gotten off to a really a slow start. They are starting to fall into a hole. If they're one in three, they are trying to keep up in their division. They very well could go to Ryan Tannehill. Mariota has just not displayed the um, consistency, the decision making, the um, the anticipation that he needs. He gets off to slow starts, puts his team in a hole, and then in the second half he's better. But by that time you're playing from behind, so he's got to get off to a better start. We'll see what he can do. Up next, got the Browns at the Ravens. So I was at the Browns last week, and now I'll be uh, on the Browns beat, it feels like, as they come to Baltimore. Looking to see the Ravens bounce back. I think they get a win here as they come home after losing to the Chiefs. I'm picking them 24-20. to 20. I think this is going to be a physical game. 
a lot of uh, you know defense, a lot of flying around, um, also a good amount of running game going. So that's why Mark Ingram is my Raven to watch because yes, they're going to be keen on Lamar Jackson, but it's going to be important that Mark Ingram continues to do his thing because establishing that run game keeps defenses honest and keeps uh, the pressure off of him. My guys to watch on the Brown side of the ball, Freddie Kitchens and Baker Mayfield. Neither one of those guys have gotten off to the start that um, the Browns need them to. Baker Mayfield's been inconsistent. He's had questionable decision making. Um, he, he, you know, has gets kind of jittery when he thinks that pressure's coming. Sometimes it's there. Sometimes he's just imagining it. Um, and so, it's on him. He's really got to come, bounce back, and, and uh, elevate his team. Meanwhile, Freddie Kitchens has not done a very good job of calling plays and game planning because uh, you're not seeing the creativity you saw last year down the stretch when he was the interim offense coordinator. Now he's the head coach. He says he's not giving up play calling duties, but he's got to get his right guys right. So we'll see what happens here for them. I think they're going to wind up being okay, but I don't think they bounce back this week. It's going to be after that. On to Buffalo, where the Patriots are visiting the Bills. I've got the Patriots winning 24-18. to My guy to watch for the Patriots is linebacker Jamie Collins. This guy has started off very hot. Team high, 19 tackles, 2.5 sacks. That defense is as imposing as they come. They give everybody fits, and they make life so much easier for their quarterback. Um, so... I am going with uh, Collins as my guy to watch on that side of the ball. On the Bill side of the ball, I'm saying Frank Gore. Josh Allen is playing well, the second-year guy. He's using his arm, using his legs, but there's going to be the defense is going to be coming after him. And so that's why they've got to be able to run the ball if they want to ease that load on um, Josh Allen and keep him from having to um, drop back under pressure again and again. If they can establish the run game, it'll kind of even things out a little bit. So we'll see if the ageless Frank Gore can uh, continue to tote the rock for them with effectiveness. Then we're going up to Detroit. Got the Chiefs visiting the Lions. I think the Chiefs stay hot. I think they will have a bit of a challenge against this Lions defense. This Lions defense and this team as a whole is a little better than um, what people were expecting. So I think the Chiefs are going to win this one 27 to 21. They're going to have to fight for it. It's going to be very imperative that they get contributions from all around because you know that the Lions are going to be um, keen on uh, Sammy Watkins and they'll be keen on Travis Kelsey. They still don't have Tyreek Hill back. So um, their young wide receiver, McCole Hardman, is going to be the guy that I'm watching there. He has made some nice contributions being uh, pressed into a bigger role than what they anticipated right now. And so if he goes off because they're going to take away the best weapons, him and I think LaShawn McCoy could wind up having big games for the Chiefs. Obviously, Patrick Mahomes will, but those guys can be on the receiving end of it. And my guy to watch for the Lions is defensive back Darius Slay. Um, he's coming off a game where he, he's, he's been disruptive. He's got an interception. He's going to have to take away um, the best receiver. It's probably going to be, I don't know if he'll be following Watkins around, but Slay needs to have a good game, get a couple turnovers, takeaways for that defense, and help them out. But I think the Chiefs wind up on top. Next, we go down to Houston where the Panthers are visiting the Texans. I've got the Texans winning 28-25. I know Kyle Allen played well last week. He had four touchdown passes. He's my guy to watch. I want to see if he can do this back-to-back -back weeks and uh, on the road both times. But I think that uh, he's a solid quarterback and a decent option while they're trying to get Cam Newton healthy. For Houston, I'm watching Whitney Marcellus, the uh, outside linebacker. He's got four sacks in three games. And so, you know, they're going to be bringing the pressure. Bill O'Brien's going to dial up that have that defense um, dialed up. They're going to go try to disrupt Allen, um, try to take away Christian McCaffrey. But getting after the quarterback is going to be key. But I've got, like I said, Texans winning at home 28-25. Then we go up to Indianapolis where the Colts are hosting the Raiders. Colts have gotten off to a good start. Jacoby Brissett has thrown two touchdown passes, two or more touchdown passes in each of the three games so far. I think he stays hot again this week, but a lot of his uh, production will hinge on T.Y. Hilton, who had a quad injury. So we're going to see what his availability and his effectiveness is. So he's my player to watch there. 
I think the Colts win. I think this will be closer than what they would like, 27 to 24. My guy to watch for the Raiders is Josh Jacobs. Derek Carr is struggling with consistency. They need to do better on third downs, and so they've got to get the run game going. I keep on saying this. It's the key. Everybody says it's the passing league, but really, you can't pass effectively unless you're Drew Brees or Tom Brady. You can't really pass effectively if you don't have that run game to back you up, and so that's why it's very important that they get control the ball they put Carr in third and manageable, manageable situations, so the rookie running back needs to have a big day. Then we go to Miami, Chargers visiting the Dolphins. You already know, Chargers winning this game. I've got them 34-13. We'll see if Keenan Allen can have another big game. He's coming off of a day where he had 183 receiving yards on 13 catches and two touchdowns. Um, I don't know who's going to stop him on that Dolphins defense because they've traded away everybody good. So um, he's going to have another big game. That's our guy to watch on that side. On the other side, Josh Rosen. He's making his second start. He threw. He didn't. He did some good things last week. He had a lot of drops by his receivers. They've got to be better for him. So Rosen had about 200 passing yards. He didn't, you know, light it up. But if he's got an effective supporting cast, he can. Um, I don't know why I'm pulling for him. I know he's in an impossible situation. He got the short end of the stick um, with Arizona, but I would like to see him um, prove that he can be an NFL quarterback and the answer for this uh, team, even though it feels like everything is just crashing and burning around him. But again, Chargers win that game 34-13, but 13 points is an improvement if you're the Dolphins. Next up, up to New York, where the Redskins visit the Giants. Um, Daniel Jones making his second start. I've got the Giants winning 20 to 18. We'll see if Daniel Jones, he's the player to watch, if he can put back to back games together. Like, you know, he had a good game against um, uh, Tampa last week. Can he do it again against this Redskins defense that's struggling? I think he should be able to. We'll find out. Um, my guy to watch on um, Washington's side of the ball is their quarterback, Case Keenum. He was awful. On Monday night, um, you know, interceptions, fumbles. Uh, he had played well the first two games of the season, but it just he just really fell apart. Um, and and you know made the Bears defense. I know it's good, but he made them look better than what they are. So we'll see if he bounces back because if they lose um, and uh, he looks awful, then there's pressure, even more pressure on Jay Gruden to switch to um, Dwayne Haskins. You would like if you're them to wait until after that game against the Patriots, open up uh, Dwayne Haskins' uh, NFL career against the Dolphins the week after that. But we'll see what happens. Out to Arizona, the Seahawks visit the, the Cardinals. But I've got the Seahawks winning 28-24. to My player to watch is running back Chris Carson. Russell Wilson is playing phenomenal. He threw 406 yards, two touchdown passes, rushed for two touchdowns. He needs some help. I mean, Chris Carson only had 53 rushing yards. He had a big fumble. Um, so I'm looking for him to bounce back and give some production and some balance just so uh, that Russell Wilson doesn't have to do it all. Yes, he's capable, but it'll make life a little easier for him. And um, so, I'm, you know, we'll see how Carson does. My guy on the Cardinals side of the ball, obviously all the attention is going to be on Kyler Murray. But I'm watching a guy on defense, Jordan Hicks, because the Cardinals have been really, really struggling to stop the run. Um, Hicks is their leading tackler at middle linebacker position there, and he needs to help rally his guys. They've got to be able to, um, you know, really limit this Seahawks defense here. If there was a game where Chris Carson's going to get right, it could be this one if Jordan Hicks and his teammates don't um, get going. Next up, I've got the Bucks against the Rams. This one shouldn't be close. We've got the Rams winning 33 to 18. Um, you know, the guy to watch for the Bucks is their kicker, Matt Gay. Jameis Winston had a good game last week, 380 yards and three touchdowns. Um, but Matt Gay missed a 34-yard field goal that would have won the game, and he missed two extra point attempts. Uh, this kid might not be very long for this team if he does not bounce back and make those key kicks when he has to. So he's my guy to watch on that team. Oh, and the Rams, you know, I'm putting it, the guys I want to watch, 
are their offensive line because yes they win um they're doing well they're undefeated but their offensive line struggled in pass protection last week against the browns and so um you know a guy who's leading the charge for the bucks is shaquille barrett he had four sacks last week the week before that against uh carolina he had three sacks so he moves all around the line it's going to be on this Rams offensive line to protect Jared Goff, to establish the line of scrimmage so they can have an effective run game. So we'll see how they do. Coming down the home stretch here, we got the Vikings visiting the Bears. Got the Vikings winning 27 to 24. Uh, Dalvin Cook is my player to watch. He's on pace for 2,000 yards. Um, really doing well, rushing the ball. Um, you know, they're so effective running the ball. Um, it has helped their passing game. Kirk Cousins bounced back last week. Um, we'll see if they can make this two in a row. They're on the road. I have them winning, even though they're on the road. I think that um, I don't think the Bears are nearly as good as the Redskins made them look, and so I think they come crashing back down just a little bit. And so Cook is my guy to watch on that side. The other side of the ball, it's Khalil Mack. What a monster he is, and he just creates so much disruption that he sets up his teammates for big games. Um, but I think that Mitch Trubisky and that offense probably goes back to the form that we saw from them before they played the Redskins. Then we've got the Jags going out to Denver. Um, I think the Broncos finally get off the schneid and they get a win here. It's going to be close 18 to 16. My players to watch for them are Bradley Chubb and Von Miller. Neither one of those guys has a sack through three games. How is that possible? Two very good uh, pass rushers, sackless, and they've got to get after Gardner Minshew. So um, they're my players to watch. We'll see what um, uh, what what they what they got. You know they've they've got the ability. I don't know if it's scheme or what. Um, but Vic Fangio is a very good defense coordinator. But I don't know if they're just gelling, getting used to his system or what. My player to watch on the Jaguar side of the ball, of course, is Gardner Minshew. This kid is better than what I thought he was going to be. He's completing 73.8% of his passes. That's the highest for a rookie quarterback in the Super Bowl era. And he's got no interceptions. That is pretty impressive um, for a guy who nobody was counting on to do anything because he was backing up Nick Foles. But we'll see if he can uh, get enough help all around so that way they can win a game. But it's going to be tough to win at mile high. Um, I That's why I've got the Broncos winning. Next, the Sunday night game, the Cowboys at the Saints. I've got the Saints winning this one, 27 to 24. I know they probably should not, uh, but I feel like the Dome's a tough place to play. The Cowboys are feeling themselves. They haven't really played uh, you know, much of anybody to speak of so far, um, but my player to watch is Dak Prescott. He's got nine touchdown passes, only two interceptions. He still has not gotten that contract extension, and each week it drags on. There's pressure on him, uh, but he is responding to it well. If he plays well, it really gives his team a chance to win here. Um, so we'll see how he does on the road. And then my player to watch for the Browns is Alvin Kamara. He's got to be huge once again. He had a great game all around running, pass catching, making life easy for Teddy Bridgewater last week, and he was very instrumental in them getting that win. He's got to do it again. He's going against a very good Dallas defense. And uh, if he can be effective and lighten that load on Bridgewater, Bridgewater continues to be um, the, the filling guy that they need. And the Saints remain in contention in that division. Monday night, I don't know how pretty this game is going to be. I don't know if you want to stay up for this one. Just watch the highlights afterwards. It's going to be the Bengals at the Steelers. I'm going with the home team. I think the Steelers win this one, 18 to 16. Mason Rudolph did not impress in his uh, debut. Only 174 yards passing, two interceptions. Um, he looked like a guy who needs work. And so um, until they get things settled in their offense, figuring out who outside of Juju Smith they have as a receiver, uh, figuring out how to get James Conner back into his groove, um, I think they're going to struggle. But I think their defense is making some plays. Those young guys are starting to come into their own and they are further along in their development than the Bengals offense is. They are not playing well. Andy Dalton is struggling. He's my player to watch for them. He's thrown three interceptions. He just, you know, I know he's learning a new offense and, and adjusting to a new head coach, but uh, it's been a disappointing start so far. 
They're looking for their first win, and I think they're going to be looking a bit longer again. I've got the Steelers winning 18-16. So there you have it. All the picks for week four. We will see how it all plays out. And then I'll come to you guys Monday morning with the recap of the action. I'll be in Baltimore, like I said. Got the Baltimore Ravens and the Cleveland Browns and also all the other action from around the league. If you have any suggestions or questions, email me at mjones at usatoday.com. And again, you can find all my stories at usatoday.com and follow me on Twitter at by Mike Jones, Instagram at by Mike Jones. And hey, if you're enjoying this podcast, spread the word, tell your friends, download it, subscribe. And um, thanks again for listening. I'll see you next week.